If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound with mine, then let us struggle together. That war was much harder to kill it because as much as you can be evil, it's hard for you to inflict harm to another kid so people would not harm them and at the same time they, you know, they follow you blindly. So Kony kept fighting but he never won the war. At the Sheridan Hotel, which now the Sheridan had been used as a barracks, so it got broken windows and Everything. It was just, and, and you didn't move um, beyond five o'clock. It was just a very, very different place. I volunteered with refugees from Somalia and I decided to learn a little bit more about their situation. And um, once I did that, I started to research some things about Africa and I learned about the war in Northern Uganda. Where 40 to 60,000 children were kidnapped made into child soldiers and sex slaves, and I decided that that was unacceptable. He's a warlord who experts say is responsible for the kidnapping of up to 70,000 people, many of them children. Operating first in Uganda, now in three other African countries, he and his militants have killed and disfigured tens of thousands of villagers, forced young boys to become child soldiers, forced girls into sexual slavery. Joseph Kony and his so-called Lord's Resistance Army have been doing this for a quarter century, trying to overthrow the Ugandan government in favor of a regime based on the Ten Commandments. He's on the run from African forces and their American advisors. to Uganda just to see what I could do, if there was anything I could do. After, the, after a war, all of the social structures are gone. And so that is the only thing that was active was the church. Schools were closed, post offices closed, phones didn't work. I mean, it's every single social structure that you imagine was just gone. But the the one structure that usually always remains in many situations is, is the church.
called the Nordic Syndrome, which is affecting our our young people. That is for sure. We don't know the cause, where it came from, why it makes people, it makes for the men without energy. We, we cannot do that. We cannot, we cannot help ourselves because we don't know the medicine. So that one for sure is a suffering because we have over 3,000 nodding syndrome victims or young people in Pade district. We have over 2,000 in Kitu and in Umoro we have some. So that is for sure something bad. That's a total suffering. This child has lost almost four of his brothers and sisters and this is how it is remembered by drawing. Is it true that the Lord is still manifested the grace? Mm -hmm. We can remember this. And Nidia Amin left. He, uh, when Nidia Amin was in power, he had taken all the young men, like these young men's age, and just put them in prison because they were a huge threat to him. And then once he went out of power, nobody knew why they were there. And this, as often happens at the end of a war, everybody's afraid to make decisions about anything. And so uh, the organization I was working with basically went around to prisons, got these guys out of prison. They'd been in prison for two or three years, put them on farms just to get them using their muscles again, get them strong, and then reconnect them with their families. Time came when people were supposed to go back to their homes. They created up a satellite satellite camps. Satellite camps were camps that were nearest to each to the villages. Say you come from this village, a camp could be created here. From here, you will commit from here to your original village to do farming. Gradually, then they began getting back home. Then they did away with this camp. But still, you will find water points created even in the satellite camps. When they came back home, there was a terrible water problem in the communities. You find the springs that we are trying to shelter being shared with cows and goats and other animals. And the water, you, you think it's not something that should be drunk, but no alternative. That's when we came in try to shelter a few water points that we could afford. And there are places where we will not find springs. That gave us the idea of really shallow wells. Each of us support one another. So if you think of a child you are supporting, think of so many other persons you are supporting. You know? And that is how we live. We also have hope that uh, certainly we live by ourselves and we support ourselves and our children in school. <laughs> So in 2008, I felt like it was a safe time to travel, and um, I decided to come to Uganda, like I said, to see what I can do. Or what I I'm sorry, got a scratch my face. To see what I could do, um, and I came over here and had a person that I knew who was living here, and he showed me around, um, took me to different projects and places, and. He said that his dream was to have um, bring back a girls' soccer team because he ran a soccer program and he wanted uh, me to come over and bring American girls so that we could show Ugandan girls uh, that they could play soccer and do things that boys did. And also we could use soccer as a platform to teach other things that were important. So I brought back a soccer team in 2009 
And one day the girls and I were walking through a refugee camp. Um, it's called an IDP camp or an internally displaced people camp. And an old man um, came upon us quite angrily and started yelling and saying, Why have we forgotten our people? What you know are you going to do about our suffering? Madame like him, her like her. She came here pretty good to see her to look and chapa. Good. Good. Go. God serve you. We are to that chapa can love. You can see an old man like myself. Nowhere to sleep. I sleep in the poorest. I cannot talk. You white people have come to serve us, but serve with sincerity. We have suffered a lot. We have suffered a lot. It is up to you to go there and release it in front that can deter us particularly. Go and serve America. Go and serve Uganda. Come to a jolly, promise a jolly, that one day they will be uplifted. Thank you. And he kept saying, go back and tell the people, um, tell the people the Acholi have suffered. And I was really touched and I felt like I needed to do something more. And so that day I made a promise to him and um, promised him that I would do something. So I went back to the United States um, and I brought back a bunch of paper bead jewelry. I was going to start selling it to friends and family with the school fees for an orphan. And when I saw that people loved the jewelry, I decided that was the way I could fulfill the promise to Tiger was to employ women, and then my model was to use the proceeds to be a best back of women and pay school fees for many of the orphan kids. So my my mission and thought is to create cross-cultural connections with Ugandans. So we don't come in as white saviors, we're here to save the day. Um, with my expeditions, it's my hope to expose the members of the expedition to lots of different projects and um, really educate them about the issues in Uganda so that um, a spark is ignited and they go back and do something, whether it's in their own communities or here, um, find a passion that makes their hearts safe and makes them feel, um, feel like um, the world is bigger than themselves. So my, my model is to really be partners in community and form relationships versus come in and solve problems. So when I went to Ghana in 2014, um, I went with a group that is based on helping people in Ghana get an education. So our main focus was helping build a school. Um, and so we did a lot of labor work. Um, I stayed there about a month. And so most of our days were spent pickaxing, shoveling, um, mudding mixing cement together, painting, um, and so it was a lot of hard work. Not a whole lot of our time was actually spent with the people, it was mostly just in their village um, doing the building and supplying um, the materials and a few of the older men would help out, um, but most of the villagers would walk past or sit and watch um, because they were intrigued by the white people. Um, but there was no real bond or connection so much um, as there was when I went to Uganda. The African Promise Foundation, their main focus was to build relationships and to create a bond um, between two people um, and just so happened to be a white person and a black person to create that bond between. Um, the idea was to provide things 
that we could possibly help with, um, but that wasn't all that we were there for. Um, and it was important to us in this foundation that we went in with the idea of providing love and providing friendship rather than um, giving them the idea of what a lot of Africans think of us as white saviors. It's, it depends on the hearts of the individuals. Every assistance depends on where it is coming from. If the U.S. government says so, it's different from what an American citizen says so. The U.S. government can have their programs through USAID, but that one has strings attached. It could be for political reasons, they could be wanting something from Uganda. For example, I can think that they could want to build a refinery or they could want the Ugandan oil or something. That is U.S. government. It's properly political and it operates out of the U.S. foreign policy. But if an individual like you, Jess, you come to Uganda because you are touched, your heart feels pain, and you think you can do something, and you don't have any strength attached to your assistance, that's a welcome idea. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of our visitors who have brought us love and care and just really brought a lot of joy in our hearts. the same loves, the same desires, and it always just, the value of the human life and how important it is to just value people and just appreciate that we may have been born in different places, so we have access to different opportunities, um, and just the responsibility of to whom much is given, much is, is required. I think it's really important to choose um, someone to work with in your career that has uh, a model where they're not coming in as solution, problem solver, white savior, um, kind of things, not a band-aid fix, but really um, partnering with locals so that the power is in the hands of the locals and um, not thinking we have the solution to all the problems. So somebody who listens to the community who goes in and consults the LC chairman or um, the district leader, or somebody who knows something about Africa. Uh, I've heard stories before of people coming in and putting in Western toilets into schools, thinking, oh, we're going to do something wonderful, and the pit latrine is still there, and the students prefer the pit latrine. So really asking the people, what do they want, and what do they desire to help them toward development? Maybe they don't want a toilet, but maybe solar power would really benefit them. African Hospitality Institute um, that is really far out in the village, <laughs> far away. Um, it's owned by an American woman um, who has decided and has learned and is teaching the proper way um, to provide to communities that are in need. Um, the understanding is that there are people that are in need um, in those parts of the country, but she has it set up so that we as Americans who are blessed with um, physical things, so to say, are able to bring those things over school supplies, um, you know, even recess materials so that kids can play, um, clothing, that we're able to donate those things and not receive any glory for it. And so there's not this tie between um, we as an American people and the things that are brought to them. So what she.
you know, you will know them by their love. And so we're just very strongly feeling that we model working together and being a part of each other's lives, and it just helps model it to everybody else. Now, I take issue with their approach, uh, very much focused on uh, the white Westerners' ability to parachute in and resolve a problem that Africans are unable to deal with themselves. I think by portraying Westerners as the only people who can crack this problem of Joseph Kony, it, it's simplistic, it's naive, and it's a little bit condescending as well. So we went to a Nodding Syndrome facility and um, we brought supplies that a lot of people in America had donated for, so tons of clothes and materials and menstrual cycle kits, and we stood up in front of this entire village because people came from all over the village, miles and miles away, and we passed these clothes out, we passed these kits out, um, and we had them lined up while we stood in the line and passed them out. Um, as we did that, there was a quick turn in their attitude toward we as a people. There was a bond at the beginning. Um, there was a united and there was a family bond at the beginning, but as soon as we stood up to hand out things um, and set them in a line, there turned an attitude of need, of course, which we understand that they need, but um, there was a wall all of a sudden thrown up between the friendship that was originally built and all of a sudden we were higher up than them. And that's how it felt, and that's what it was. Standing up there and passing out clothes and um, singing, seeming almost better than them. Um, it's almost heartbreaking. I don't, I don't know that I can exactly explain how it feels. Um, I, got, I remember getting on the bus and having just this sick feeling in my stomach, like we had done something extremely wrong, when the idea was to do something right. Finally, um, having in mind that we are all human beings, we must look at unity as the summing force and aim at developmental issues regardless of race, religion, <coughs> color, political background, or cultural origin. We therefore feel very optimistic to continue to really share our experiences, our vision, our challenges, and possible solutions for the success of this cultural institution. It was important to um, build friendship, friendships from the very beginning, and so her entire organization is based off getting help um, from locals um, who understand where the need in the community is at, and she partners with them so that she, as a group, her organization isn't going in as an American organization and saying, here's what we think is best for you, and we're going to provide it for you. Um, because that's where a lot of people who are wanting to do good feel wrong.